Hey, thanks. Uh, welcome everybody to the opening day session for day two of Black Hat Asia. My name is Jeff Wilson, and I am the chief analyst for cybersecurity technology at Omdia. Uh, and we have a really great panel here uh, to have a, a discussion about uh, what's uh, what's coming next. 2020 was a year like um, never before. Well, I don't know, not in my time. Um, Normal life across the world was upended due to a pandemic, uh, uh, including how we work, how we live. Uh, the pandemic and the lockdowns and shelter in place orders that followed had a tremendous impact on the cybersecurity ecosystem as well. Um, although everyone adapted quickly to the new world, embraced the new, new uses of technology to work from home, um, there are many new threats and vulnerabilities to deal with as a result. Um, so far, 2021 brings a vaccine uh, in some cases, a return to semi-normal or normal in some parts of the word, uh, world, and some well-deserved hope and opportunity for organizations to maybe relook at how uh, they they think about cybersecurity, infosec, and secure connectivity in the in the face of these massive changes that we've gone through. Um, unfortunately, uh, all of these changes make infosec's job a lot harder. Um, so, what are those changes, and how can organizations deal with them? That's what we really want to discuss today. Um, the, the panel has already uh, been introduced, but I'd like to just go ahead and thank Neil, Lydia, Vandana, and Vitali for being here today. Uh, and um, we all we are taking questions uh, from the audience. We'll probably take most of them at, at the end, but if I see something interesting along the way, I am monitoring, so maybe we'll sneak one in. So make sure if you do have questions for us or things you want to make sure we cover, um, that you go ahead and let us know. All right, so the first question I want to ask, um, I want to give everybody an opportunity to sort of give their position on um, what you think are the key forces uh, in your view that are shaping the future of cybersecurity. So when you're um, trying to create a picture for someone of what's coming or what's next, what are the things that you really um, consider as, as the key drivers? And I'll start with Lydia. Thanks, Jeff. Um... I think I think I think you hit the nail on the head when you sort of mentioned the year that was really the pandemic. And I know, I guess, in in my line of work, um, a big discussion that we had yesterday in our meetup is just the push to digital transformation, um, with people being encouraged to stay home, um, stay safe, protect loved ones. Um, people still need to shop. They still need to see their doctor. They still need to rent. They still need to attend appointments for their kids. So we're seeing a lot of those face-to-face -face previous um, interactions move to more of a digital experience. And I know I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that aggressively push um, in you know, many of the organizations that I'm working for as well. Um, and I guess, I guess the flow and effect that I see is a massive impact is the ability then to assess those companies. So I think previously we would do some sort of due diligence or third party assessment. But I think there's a much bigger focus on that. You know, we need to say, we, we need to have a look at that where I think before it was, we're doing it, but I think now we need to put more of a focus on it. You know, I can see some, we, we need X thing, let's team makes purchase of X thing. And then they come up to security and go, oh, hey, we need to do the due diligence. And it's, seeing that maybe things aren't up to scratch or perhaps we didn't look all the requirements and you know we just kind of kept accepting risk after risk after risk so i guess for me still a massive focus on digital transformation and just ensuring um whoever we're outsourcing our data to is is uh, is safe and secure excellent um i'm just going to go in the order of my zoom screen because that's the easiest so grifter you're next Sure. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know, I think Lydia hit the nail on the head. Digital transformation is huge. I think when it comes to information security, we have always been expected to be agile, right, and respond to who knows what the next day, right? Um, one day everything seems fine. You're like, oh, yeah, we're great. Everything's secure. We're good. And then somebody uh, discovers that there's a vulnerability out there in some product that you're using in your environment or exploit code is found on a site somewhere that uh, that tells you that it's been out there for a little while and our whole world changes um, the next morning. And and for me, that's part of the joy of, of information security is you just never know what's coming. But but the last, you know, 18 months, uh, 
have put us in a whole different place when it comes to to being agile right we we are used to responding to things like oh there's a new vulnerability or there's a new exploit we're not used to responding to hey your entire workforce just went home um now defend against that and so so that's been a really interesting uh, you know challenge for for all of us um one defending uh a network that now just expanded out into the living rooms and uh and corners of of kitchens all around the world but um but also the um the way that our employees were working and the way that the individuals were defending were working and the way that information has been shared has been um has been in incredibly challenging and sometimes fun, uh, a lot of times frustrating. Uh, but um, like I said, I think I think we were we we're well positioned for that kind of challenge, just based on the fact that um, our industry pulls us in a lot of different directions every day, and and having to um, respond to that. Um, I think we we had a we have a pretty good crew <laughs> out there in our industry who uh, I think in, in a lot of cases pulled it off. Yeah, we will we will talk about that crew a little bit later. I mean, I will say, you know, for context, everyone had their own experience. Um, but I mean, I had vendors in the security space, particularly in kind of the VPN secure connectivity space, say um, mm -hmm. they had customers call them a big customer that had 50,000 concurrent VPN sessions, call them and say, hey, in the next two weeks, we need to we need to scale that up to 250,000. This is like, <laughs> we knew the perimeter was going away and it has like gradually gone away, but it's never done that before. So that was, and you know, everyone's probably got a good story like that, that they could tell. How, how about you, Vitaly? What, you know, what are your thoughts on the pandemic and, you know, maybe some of the lasting effects uh, and changes in InfoSec? Uh, well, uh, I have to start from uh, saying good day, everyone. And uh, I'm totally um, aligned with what Christopher said that they, pandemic definitely changed the environment and the way we work. But uh, being part of the anti-malware industry, we also observed that it changed not only, you know, the defender side work, but also the uh, malware creators and malware operators too. Uh, we've seen them uh, following the trend of, um, of these waves, basically, where waves would uh, completely, uh, you know, shut down their activities, sometimes down to the very, very low level, and then when uh, there was some, uh, you know, easiness in, in moving around and uh, maybe people got used to working from home, they, they restarted some of their operations. And th this has reflected on the number of uh, malware samples we detected on the customer's machines, which was quite interesting to follow. Um, and we also have seen them abusing this a lot. And this is something that um, I wouldn't expect, I mean, ethically wise uh, from the uh, attackers from from the malware writers from the malware operators uh, to be very uh, to have very high uh, ethical standards, but they they definitely abuse such a topic that shouldn't be touched at all uh, by you know masquerading masquerading their uh, attack campaigns behind let's say a vaccine availability or some payouts for people in need or government regulations updates and things like this. They use of for social engineering. To trick the users, you know, to follow that link or open the attachment and and, and attack their machines, and I think this is really really bad uh, that's going on. Um, but otherwise, uh, I I do believe I'm I'm an optimist and I believe that uh, the pandemic will pass and we will get back to the uh, normal world. And I think that um, the question you started uh, you you raised in the beginning, like what drives uh, InfoSec? Um, I think uh, we have more and more role of InfoSec now in terms of the international, you know politics it's used as a, as a tool now and uh, this is going just uh, only to, to, in, to increase uh, we see all these uh, indictments uh, for apt attackers that are believed to be nation states supported uh, seven day country and this is going to escalate even further in my opinion and infosec can become really very politicized uh, area uh, and uh, we definitely have to be prepared for that somehow yeah, excellent. And then, of course, last but not least, uh, we have Vendana. So if you, yeah. you have Hi, some overall thoughts. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, good. How about you? Oh, <laughs> doing this. <laughs> Great. The... So I'll start off with saying hi, everyone. Um, so I'll add on to what my co-speaker said. Uh, we all know that year and a half was very different than we anticipated which led to the whole paradigm shift where cloud migration and computing took the top priority. 
And uh, as you mentioned that the boundaries don't exist anymore. So focus of all the organizations started shifting to uh, something called zero trust networks. Like everybody started talking about in the past year that we need to attain zero trust, uh, working with multiple technologies uh, to build the whole uh, entire ecosystem. That's there. But how about uh, security of third party software and dependencies? And you'll see me talking about that a lot. But I believe this is one area which needs a lot more attention, which was there but it needs more attention because it has creeped up on its own form, like in a different form uh, with a larger security ecosystem issues. We saw in the last year that we had some major issues uh, by the end of the year. And um, apart from that, insider threats. Uh, now, earlier, what used to happen, uh, we had routers, firewalls, everything which was monitored inside the building. We were all going to office, monitoring was happening. But now we are all home. Uh, we are accessing our corporate network using our home routers, personal devices. So that again poses a big risk and which in turn brings us to a point wherein we need to have a holistic picture of everything, uh, wherein we are allowing our employees, everyone to work from home, but then we are giving them the less of, less of rights. So it becomes important to have a cloud ready approach. We need to have zero trust networks wherein we are monitoring it to the max and ultimately when it comes down to humans human are human um, we cannot train them to a point wherein they don't mistakes so they don't make mistakes like we do make mistakes then comes AI and ml into the picture wherein uh, we are trying to uh, get as much as information trying to correlate and uh, yesterday also we saw the keynote around lessons from 11 billion reached records which are on around breaches and the dump now, to try, to try and avoid that, we need to have uh, uh, better technologies. And I wouldn't say that uh, the organizations don't have it. It's just that sometimes it's not used to its fullest. So that that's my two cents on it. All right. And actually kind of dovetailing with that, we have a couple of questions in from the audience. And the first one is, it's not just BYOD. The employee's entire house is part of your threat model now. Um, they specifically d directed the question at, at Neil, but in, anyone wants to take, how do you deal with the fact that it's not just their device, it's their smart TV? I mean, I, I don't know if anyone's done a count on connected devices in your house, mm -hmm. uh, but in my house, it's like over 40. Yep. So, and, and, I, and I think that that's, you know, not uncommon. So w what would you suggest for dealing with that? that so issue? I think, I think um, you know, Vandana said it uh, perfectly, like, zero trust has been a buzzword for you know a few years everybody you know, zero trust zero trust zero trust um but now it's a necessity right it's not um it's no longer just a buzzwordy thing and you hear a lot of people talking about it a lot more um because that's that's kind of the solution when it comes from a network standpoint as far as like now I've got this laptop in my house and I leave my doors unlocked because I live in the midwestern United States and I think that everything's fine um you know, that that I don't know, I, I could individually stop by people's houses and sleep on their couch for a couple of days and try to like secure things up. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll throw that out there to the audience. I'll come sleep on your couch and help you try to secure your laptop. <laughs> oh, man, um, I'm not sure you want to make that offer, but there it is. <laughs> no. But, uh, but yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, that that's the new challenge, right? And I think Zero Trust answers some of that, um, but it doesn't answer all of it. And we're going to be trying to figure it out for a while because the thing that um, I don't think any of us are surprised by is that now that everybody has gone home to work and we can see that people are productive from home, guess what? They don't want to go back to the office. So mm -hmm. this is here to stay. Yeah, it is fascinating to drive around anywhere and look at all the commercial real estate in progress, buildings still being built, and just wondering <laughs> what happens. Um, anyone else have thoughts on securing your home? Or I think we can probably move on to the next, the next topic on the list here. Um, so I wanted to talk. Obviously, the pandemic was you know kind of the overwhelmingly discussed issue of the last year, um, but you know things actually did happen. Noteworthy events happened, and, and in particular, the solar winds attack which, um, you know, very starkly demonstrated the vulnerability of the supply chain. Uh, not something that hasn't been discussed in the past, but this was such a massive and uh, wide event that, that it's like hard to sweep it under the rug, even in the middle of a pandemic and a 
crazy election in the United States and everything else that was going on. So it was a fairly significant event. Um, are we going to see a lot of new vendors pop up as a result, a lot of new silver bullet type uh, solutions to protect against these types of attacks? Or what do you think the cohesive strategy moving forward is for dealing with these supply chain attacks? Uh, Vitaly, you want to go first, maybe? Sure. Um, so definitely the topic I, I would love to explore more. And uh, we've been warning about the uh, supply chain attacks for uh, several years now, since it all started, I think. Um, uh, one one big uh, was uh, I think 2017 2016 shadow pad attack on a manufacturer of uh, SSH software or um, enterprises with software for basically service uh, and uh, clients, and um, it was discovered just randomly uh, in one of in one big corporation um, just because of some suspicious traffic. But it was a uh, kind of the big big page that was opened uh, in terms of. Uh, supply chain attacks uh, and we've seen uh, digitally signed software being distributed in in tens of thousands of copies to a number of companies worldwide and breached uh, through it uh, and uh, I think this is not going to stop anytime soon it is so efficient because it just goes be below the radar of all security solutions uh, usually such software has uh, first uh, the reputation of the vendor that created it. Uh, second is a digital signature, just sealing this trust that is put by people, you know, over years to the vendor. Um, and then after all, uh, you are willingly going and downloading or purchasing that software. So it's not just a random thing that popped up in your mailbox. So you kind of tend to trust it since the beginning. And this is where uh, something that uh, you guys uh, brought up already, the zero trust model is really applicable. I think it's the most efficient. You shouldn't trust the trusted software. That's the thing. You shouldn't trust the trusted hardware as well. So that's the zero trust approach you should apply on the enterprise level, on your individual um, you know, property level. Uh, and just, you know, um, there is this old saying, trust but verify, right? So whenever you purchase something, uh, some supply chain software, just do some basic verifications at least. And I have to say from experience of past attacks, they could have been discovered if they were uh, if they were checked in a sandbox, for example, for any suspicious traffic going out of them or any potential, you know, hijacking of the, you know, legitimate uh, DLL code in the binary. So there are solutions that can offer this. I don't think there is a silver bullet to make it short, but uh, I think that applying zero trust model and following the principles um, should lead us the right way. The yeah, interesting point that zero trust is more than just the people and end systems, but it's also uh, should be applied to this uh, supply chain. Vendana, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when we talk about supply chains, as I mentioned that they have been there, and the, the most, uh, or I would say, the renewed focus comes from the seriousness of the impact that SolarWinds attack had last year, and which was considered uh, some of the most, uh, and especially on the, some of the most secure organizations. Uh, there is a different spectrum to it, like how exactly it's coming up. Uh, if the compliance like GDPR, CCPA, and all of these are not there, companies or organizations might uh, not be able to share that there is a breach that exists. So it's a tangential uh, benefit that they have, uh, they have been breached and they have to notify it. And uh, if I talk about especially the one that happened last year, which was detected because um, we have more observability and we have more visibility into the network. And that's when some of the vendors who are more into the uh, figuring out things and finding out that what are the threats that exist in the network and how exactly we can uh, find them. And that's when they came up with this, that, okay, there is something that exists in this network. So attacks are happening, but only a few who are actually able to find it. And uh, there's another important aspect is that there is a huge, huge trust between, uh, which is uh, assumed, I would say, uh, assumed between different entities in the software building process these days. Every software project which takes its uh, security seriously is trying to develop secure applications from the get-go and trying to put out a secure by design product out there. However, uh, they still have to trust a lot of external dependencies, be it primary uh, or proprietary code, uh, third party APIs, open source code for their softwares. And this is where all the attacks come from. And that's when we need to talk more about observability. We need to talk more about um, uh, visibility into the network. 
And hence, I'm sure uh, we're going to see a lot more of uh, what we call as supply chain attacks if we don't have the right kind of visibility into the environment. Gotcha. Anybody else want to add anything to that before we move on? All right. L looks like we're clear. So um, a little bit of a technology or solution focused question, but I think it's an interesting one. Um, you know, in security, we uh, in acquiring technology to protect ourselves, you know, across devices and networks and, and systems. Um, we're always chasing new developments, new technologies. I mentioned the silver bullet already related to supply chain. Um, our industry, the technology industry is really good at inventing silver bullets. Um, maybe we haven't found any werewolves yet is <laughs> the problem because they don't seem to, they don't seem to do the job, but, uh, so everyone's looking at now at XDR, cloud delivered security, SASE, zero trust architectures, whatever, um, sec DevOps. Um, but how important are the basics of InfoSec hygiene, um, vulnerability management, patching, knowing how many assets, like how many people know how many devices in that their house are even connected to the network and what are those devices? Um, you know, we've been chasing that problem in the enterprise forever, basic logging and monitoring uh, practices, uh, password management, you know, all, all of the boring stuff that we stopped talking about a long time ago. How, uh, how important do you guys think that stuff is? Maybe Grifter, if you want to kick off. Sure. Um, yeah, I think actually that's, that's probably what will help us with some of the these things like supply chain attacks, where um, you are, you you do give a a certain amount of trust to an organization um, when you're using their products, and um, but if you know what's going on on your on your network or on your hosts, if you know what's happening in your environment, doing things like baselining your environment and saying this is what uh, you know this is what it looks like when things are good and we don't have an attacker here, and then you see that kind of thing change. That's what's going to help you in the, in that case, and that's a very fundamental, very basic thing. What are the devices on my network, and what are they communicating to? Right. If you see a new, um, you know, endpoint talking to an endpoint that it's never spoken to before, why is that? Right. Or a user logs into a machine they've never logged in before. You're like, those credentials have never touched that machine. Why is that? These are basic things, and so I think that's the kind of stuff that will help us even when we are putting our trust in, in you know, a, an application because it's signed by a vendor that we believe in, right? If we know, you know, um, if we put some of the same practices that we put into place when we're looking at, um, you know, living off the land attacks where we're like, oh, they're using the tools that are built into our operating system. Okay, but does that user ever use those tools? Should those tools ever talk to these things? It's that kind of fundamental security stuff that um, the, that's, hopefully going to save us and and the thing is some there are you know advancements in technology that will allow us to do that things like uh user and entity behavioral analytics where we can baseline our environment and then say tell me when something changes and then we point our threat hunters at that and say hey go look at those changes and see if there's something that i need to be worried about um the fundamentals are what will get us out of this yeah i mentioned in our prep call there was some piece of data that dropped recently about um, you know, surprise, surprise, the number one source of vulnerability and attacks in the cloud is config cloud configuration <laughs> management. And it was like, uh, th that article was like the slow moving steamroller in Austin Powers, you know, coming at us. Like, we know it's coming eventually. We're going to have to hear somebody say it out loud, but we were hoping maybe it would be different. Um, Lydia, do you have any, any additional thoughts? Yeah, I do. Thanks for asking. Um, I actually don't think it's important. I think it's critical. Um, the I think the challenge that we have is that it's it's boring. It's boring, you know, system admin or network admin type controls, and even down to the security level. And I don't think you know some it, you don't get your kicks in it as, as much. But I think it's just as important as cleaning the house or finding the holes that need to be plugged up in your house. And I mean, if I, if I give an example, a, a couple of years ago, I did some pretty intensive research on ransomware and malware and the impact that it had on the endpoints. And it was really interesting just seeing if certain hygiene or certain controls or configuration had been put on those endpoints, a lot of those malware um, uh, types would not have escaped that endpoint. And I mean, if you take 
my mind's gone back a while. If you take the um, the uh, Eternal Blue exploit, which when was that? Two, three, four years ago. I remember I was working for a company and it was just really interesting watching the exploit bounce from unpatched system to unpatched system. And then when, when you try to do a reconciliation of what are our assets? What are the patch levels that they're up to? Oh my gosh, I didn't even know I had a Windows legacy machine there. There's some real, real challenges, you know, even something is a flat network, you know, because we all want to integrate with the different states or countries or whatever. So it makes sense to have a flat network, you know, maybe. Um, but when you're not implementing basic hygiene practices, it is going to, you know, bite you in the bum type thing, because you, even when you're looking at basic, you know, security bypass research or all, all those sorts of things, that's how those security breaches happen. And if we implement good hygiene, you've got that security prevention happening. And I, I guess the harder thing to the harder thing is when you're looking at defensive security, all those prevention mechanisms, how do you then say, yes, we're doing a good job because we stopped blah, you can't the metrics around that and trying to support that work of, you know, cyber hygiene, whether it's vulnerability management or like creating a CMDB or logging or monitoring, it's really hard to put matri metrics and success wins across that at all, as opposed to reactive security where this thing happened and look, we were able to catch it in 24 hours. You don't see that with basic hygiene. And so it's not fun and sexy, you know, for those defenders that are doing that sort of work, but it is absolutely critical that we need to focus on it. Excellent. Um, does anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, if I may. I, um, I do. Yeah, all right, go we'll go Vitaly oh. first. All right, thank you. Uh, just I uh, wanted to add that uh, this recent trends of like uh, moving everything to the cloud or, or putting all the apps in the containers, it's been quite um, you know alarming to me because uh, I, I see how people how people treat this, how people uh, you know perceive this, and it, it feels like uh, when people are moving infrastructure or services to the cloud, they kind of removing the responsibility from breaches from their shoulders and putting it on shoulders of, of those providers that uh, you know serve them, and they like escaping, uh, trying to escape uh, doing their security right. So in my opinion, security fundamentals are unavoidable. So you have to do it everywhere, uh, regardless of who, whose services you are using. You have to take care of your infrastructure first, and then you can explore the opportunities. But with all these trends, it's just uh, a way to escape responsibility for, for doing the fundamentals. You take another one, for example, containerization, like Docker and, and the like. Uh, developers tend to believe that, you know, what's the problem if there is a security vulnerability? It's it's a disposable container anyway. I'm going just to, to you know, queue and respawn that container from the clean state. And there's not a problem, even if there's a security bug. They, they treat it this way. And I think that uh, they start to, to miss out on, on implementing things right and, and writing the clean code without the vulnerabilities introduced. They don't consider, like, uh, threats such as, you know, is and, and things like that. And this is, I think this is negatively impacting overall uh, global security of all services and uh, the whole world, basically. So we shall not escape the fundamentals. We shall, you know, spend our time, do our homework and uh, invest in fundamentals first and then uh, explore the opportunities that new services bring to us. Excellent. Vandana? Um, I would just um, add on to what uh, Lydia and Vitaly said. Uh, like, they have talked about from the consumer side. Now, there is one point that vendors can also do. Like every vendor, cloud provider is doing things their own way. And uh, the only way to move forward is combined effort by all of the vendors toward the unified framework of monitoring. Because when we talk about uh, misconfiguration, that has been there and that will be there. So if we don't have the combined efforts by the vendors as well, the breaches will happen and uh, whatever we will do, we will not be able to monitor them enough. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I mean, it's interesting. That's my take on it. The, what the cloud did for, um, you know, d enabling functionality in IT and networks is kind of like, um, you know, the, the development of the cloud now makes it easier to develop everything faster. And then unfortunately, security is the most difficult part to you know, to get on board quickly, but we have this established pattern in IT that if we can connect something, we will. 
Uh, and if and if connecting something makes a process more efficient, it will happen, and then we will figure everything else out later. And I think the problem of that is compounded in the cloud because of the pace of development that, that now we need to have a feedback loop in the development process for security. Um, all right, so let's move on to, well, let's see, there's a couple different areas, directions we could go here. We could stick to the cloud, uh, but I do want to make sure to talk about a few other things. Um, one is I watched a, a few sessions today that, are, that were sort of outside the technical world. One was about, um, you know, how security events is driving changes in stocks and the stock market. And, you know, and, and that's a real thing that's actually happening. And then the other was about um, attracting, uh, um, you know, good folks to enter the industry, particularly in, a in Asia Pacific, where, um, you know, the relationship between citizens and their governments is different than what I'm used to in, in the United States in some cases. Um, and it's been hard. It's hard. There's a challenge to attract talent. Um, because they're afraid of doing things that are potentially illegal for work, um, which is a totally legitimate thing to worry about. But what do you guys think about this whole concept of the skills gap, that the real brick wall in security is that by whatever estimate, there are three or four million open, unfilled positions. Um, how, do we, how do we get past that? Is, that? is it, you know, training programs and attracting more people, or is it technology that reduces the need for as many people or a mix of both? What do you guys see? Um, I'll go ahead and start with uh, Lydia on that one. Sure. Um, obviously, it's hard to comment on um, the number of job opportunities versus people looking. So if there's a skills gap, it's it's really hard to make a comment because that's obviously something I can't comment on. But yeah, I think, sure. yeah, and I think, um, I think the challenge that we face is People of our age group fell into security. You know, when we when we entered security, um, you know, we were doing degrees in computer science or uh, software engineering or whatever, and we all started out as developers or database admins or whatever. Um, and I know for me, I was an ex-developer and I got into security because I was developing something for security. And then the rest is the rest is downhill. And I know in the past, probably earlier on, when I was interviewing, I was looking for myself because we do everything perfectly, right? That's not <laughs> what it's about. That's not what it's about. You know, it's, you know, it's the, it's the diversity and it's not about women diversity. It's the, it's the diversity, it's diversity in thought. So um, when we talk about um, the gender skills gap, or sorry, sorry, the skills gap, um, I want to put it out there that I think the pandemic has actually had so many benefits from the sense that, you know, you might be looking for someone that can come into the office every day. Well, then, no, you know, we there's now people that basically are living in different states, different countries that can fill that gap. So now we're being open to go, okay, so perhaps there's not someone in the state that I live in that can make the 40 minute train ride to work, but maybe there's somebody in another state that can actually fill that gap. And I think that 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 the pandemic has really shaped the way that we employ as well or even to the perspective that hey i've really decided that i hate living in the city and i now want to live by the beach or i now want to live in the bush or in the country and companies are really supporting their employees to do that and so i think um i think those things are changing too and i think something that um, Vandana should talk about later, especially with InfoSec girls, but I know for the Australian Women in Security Network that we have here in Australia, we've got women cadets that we're trying to build them up, um, do free training, build that confidence, because it's one thing to have a formal education, but it's another thing to show that experience and that confidence. And I think that, you know, we've got so many great initiatives, the work that Vandana is doing in her, um, you know, in her spare time, the, some of the things that we're doing for Black Hat, the mentoring program when we are face-to-face. -face. Um, a lot of the B-sides now are, are mentoring people as well to help them feel confident. Um, I know friends and I, we've delivered free um, vulnerability management classes so that people understand about asset management and, and data classification. And it allows them to, to allow people to see real hands-on how it's done in the industry. And I think that 
that's really closing the gap, if you want to call it, between the formal education and getting that experience so that someone can attend an interview and say, this is what I'm doing, this is this is how I can contribute. And I think I've spoken on that because I know everyone's got more things to say, but literally I talk about this for ages. Yeah, no problem. Grifter? I'm, I'm going back around in a circle. Sure. No, yeah, that's uh, like, that's just passion. Don't worry about it. I, I love it. Um, but I think that's the thing is that we, um, like your passion, the way that you just talked about that, Lydia, is is kind of what um, may be hampering us a little bit as as an industry, because I know I, I share that same passion. Like when when I'm done doing this, I'm going to watch more talks. I'm going to do more security things like I am a hacker from from the day I was born. Right. And I think a lot of us who have come into this industry that way um, almost have expectations that everybody's going to be that way. And that's just not the case. Some people don't want to do what they do at work when they go home, right? They don't want to work the super long hours. They don't want to continue doing research or speak at conferences or do these other things that come with our industry. And so sometimes we have expectations where we bring somebody in uh, for an entry level position and we're like, well, what projects do you do and what other things are you working on? And what's your involvement in your local hacker space? And how often have you been to DEF CON? And what about B sides and you present places. And those are all fantastic things. But if we hold everybody to that standard and we're like, okay, come in, you're interviewing for this position on our uh, red team uh, and it's entry level and we're like, pop all these boxes, right? Like it's just, it's not, no. it scares people off. Um, and what we should be doing is bringing people in in those entry level positions and then giving them on the job training or fostering that, um, you know, the knowledge that they have and growing it um, by sharing our passion with them instead of just expecting them to to come ready to crush everything on day one. Um, we have a very cool industry. It is cool. I like. I don't tell people what I do if I'm on a plane because I don't want to get into Talk a giant about conversation it. about it. Right? Like so, um, so it's it is a cool industry and it does attract people. But I think um, our expectations sometimes of those employees are a little bit high. We burn them out fast or we scare them away, and so um, yeah, we just have to be careful with things like that. I don't yeah. know. I didn't mean to be a downer on that one. I guess, but no, <laughs> but I'm just though. like that's, just that's being real. That's good self reflection from the inside, though, because yeah. because then there are ways that you could take steps to change that. Look, I mean, I think the perfect pipeline into into infosec is gaming, and I I can talk to a, per, a a teenager for five minutes about their understanding of video game systems and know very quickly whether or not they'll be successful down the road in this job. What we need to do is also allow for them to be the gamer personalities at work which is obsessive, but also lazy and disconnected and, you know, the, the, and, and have those lower, you know, those lower expectations. And it's a really interesting point. Um, Vitaly, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, as far as you, you brought up the video gaming and, and I really got this question quite uh, a lot in the past by the media because I, I did interact with the gaming companies, advise them on implementing some uh, security tricks uh, in, the, in the script of the games. But uh, the point is, I, I was asked, like, do you play video games? And I, and I had to explain that I don't really. I used to play, but since I joined InfoSec, I don't have to because, you know, all my work, all my job is one big ever ending video game. So we're chasing bad guys, they're trying to counterattack and things like that. And uh, yeah, it, it's just a thrilling, thrilling job. And uh, like Grifter said, it doesn't end with your end of, of the workday. It continues over and over at night, in the morning. It doesn't matter what time it is, whether this is holiday or weekend, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's fun and you can really, really err on the right track into infosec. Just don't be very formal. And uh, another thing I wanted to add, if you want to explore this topic, like especially on the shortage of, uh, you know, the stuff uh, in cybersecurity, it was an excellent talk delivered yesterday by uh, our, uh, our colleague, uh, part of the review board on, of Black Hat Asia, Anika Devonshire. So if you missed that talk, I do recommend, let me just bring up this slide from here. I'm not sure if you see it though, but maybe it's cut out. Anyway, uh, just go back and see the recording because uh, she brought up uh, very important um, questions uh, like 
what are the drivers and, and, and kind of uh, distractions uh, from joining the InfoSec from the young generation? Because she, she interacted and, and lectured in a university. She interacted with students a lot. So she kind of studied this question and tried to understand, like, what's the, what are the psychological barriers from, from joining InfoSec uh, and, um, you know, having enough of stuff? Um, and she also gives a very wise, um, I would say, um, advice uh, or, or uh, hint of uh, how to do it right, not to get in trouble, how not to be scared of, of breaking the law uh, accidentally. And uh, she does it very, very right, delivered very on point. So I do recommend to revisit that if you missed it. Yeah, yeah, that was the session I was referring to as well. It was really, it was really interesting. Uh, and then uh, last but not least, Vandana. Sure. Um, so as uh, my fellow speakers said, people want to be there, but a lot of times they're not, not welcomed. The, over, uh, the overall mindset of learning to learn new things need to be taught so that they can feel welcomed. Like uh, uh, Britta said, that uh, we expect people to learn from the very first day, which is not easy for any one of us. Individual from different domains should be able to learn and join the cybersecurity force, workforce. And uh, people here are very much uh, uh, into the zone wherein they want to share information, but we need to understand a point wherein we need to welcome them at the same time. While we all are in this profession, it's out of our passion, like totally. Not everyone here will be for the passion. So we need to create an ecosystem where we, uh, people can learn the skills and join the workforce. And uh, when I talk about diversity, uh, when I started my own initiative, and like uh, I started InfoSec Girls or uh, rejuvenated InfoSec Girls, uh, the, the point was that we need to have more women power. But I feel it's not to do with just the gender diversity, but we need to have skill diversity. And as Lydia said, thoughts diversity. We need to consider people who are developers, testers, uh, people who are not from the regular pool of the candidates that we look for. Like we need a people who, or we need a person who is five years in the industry, but uh, maybe reach out to universities, maybe reach out to remote cities, maybe reach out to communities and create opportunities for everyone. Like uh, the saying goes, talent is distributed equally, but opportunities are not. So that's what we have to look at at the moment. Excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really interesting conversation. I, I, I still feel like uh, with two teenagers in the house, I keep telling them based on their ability to operate, uh, you know, discord and, you know, whatever six games they're playing and consume three Twitch feeds and then, you know, f you know, figure out how to get their character, you know, maximum strength for the fastest possible kills. It's like, all right, I know what you guys should be doing. <laughs> you just you get to do it against real people. So uh, I'm curious to see if that's uh, something that I've never really thought about looking into industry organizations with specifically that in mind, but I'm curious to see if they're out there. Um, all right, so another big picture topic. Um, we have some questions from the audience, and I'm going to save uh, the last 10 minutes or so to go through those. Um, but obviously, the, you know, the, the nation state attack has been a thing since, you know, networks first existed. Some of the very first networks were military and government networks in the first place. And so the idea that they contain useful information or things that, that attackers might want um, is not new. Um, but we are certainly seeing an escalation in the amount of conversation about it because of all the coordinated disinformation campaigns. So part of it is hacking, stealing, you know, it's Stuxnet or whatever else. But the other part of it is the subtle manipulation of public sentiment using, you know, using the Internet. Um, great talk at, uh, at Black Hat USA. There was a big focus because the election was coming up uh, from the Stanford Internet Observatory about this exact topic. Um, so what do you think as an, as an employee at a company and your job is to help make that company secure, what do you think is the larger role of cybersecurity professionals in this you know, politi heavily politicized world of attacks? Is it something you think, is this another possible inhibitor? Like, d does a person think, well, I don't want to get into cybersecurity because I don't want to have to deal with, like, you know, what if I find some attack from another country and I end up on, you know, somebody's radar? It's like, it's like another potential barrier. But what do you think, what do you think the role of a, of a InfoSec professional is in, in, in politics? Um, Grifter, we'll go ahead and hit you first. I'm like, are you insane? Like, that's a, what a question. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, you know, honestly, I think that um, our role should be more enablers than we are. Um, people often look at, at the security team as the people who are always telling them they can't do something, right? Um, or they're not allowed to do it. And, and I think that that, that has to change. Um, the, everybody's talking about security. Everybody is watching it on the news all the time. You can't open up your browser without seeing another news story about some ransomware campaign or whatever. And so um, we can be educators and we can be enablers or we can be the person who tells them no all the time. And, you know, I'd, I'd rather be the first, so. Yeah, I mean, it isn't you're in an interesting position because there are not very many jobs that you could go to school for or not whatever learn how to do and then end up being Jack Ryan one day, just because <laughs> of something that happens at, you know, something that happens to your company that's part of a, a nation state campaign and it's a, you're in this weird position to maybe like self deputize and, you know, or become a hero. Um, uh, Vitaly, what do you what are, what are your thoughts on this issue? I'm sure you have some. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. We were in this uh, turmoil a few times in the past. And um, what um, I have to say is what, what helped us, uh, I think, is um, keeping neutrality, um, being solid, uh, being listened to pretty much everyone, regardless of who is attacking you, what are their motives, what they are serving their country, whether they are maybe terrorists in another country. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you just uh, deal with cyber attacks. We, you, you, you prevent them. You help people defend against them, regardless where they are coming from and what, where, what are their intentions. Um, we, of course, know that, uh, and it was confirmed several times, that the uh, nation state uh, malware or implants where, where abuse or vulnerabilities were used uh, for nefarious purposes by, by criminals. Uh, they were adopted and uh, reused, repurposed. And this is happening. So we, we, we cannot really um, count on attribution as well. Uh, this is an important point to bring up, I think. Uh, I think ever since uh, we had this attack on Olympic Games in, in South Korea in 2018, I think, there was an Olympic destroyer campaign that tricked the whole industry uh, into believing that it was somebody else. Uh, but it was a like very carefully crafted campaign of disinformation that tricked a lot of security researchers in doing uh, wrong attribution. So um, ever since then, I think oh, we kind of stopped, completely stopped attributing to particular entities because we always leave uh, more and more chance for a uh, very like smart evil um, disinformation campaign, uh, like false flagging in, in a very ingenious ways. Um, so you have to consider that and be neutral. Uh, be ethical and be be nice to to everyone. I think that's the way to go. Otherwise, it's just going to be a start of uh, I know new Cold War be between you know major powers in the world if if we get politicized too much. Yep. Uh, anybody else want to jump in on that one? I forgot what the question was again. <laughs> I, I think we covered it pretty well, and we have just about nine minutes left, and we have some questions from the audience. Uh, first one is um, sort of malware focused, so I'm guessing Vitaly, but I'm sure other people will have thoughts. Um, Ram ransomware malware has refocused on crypto for the last six to nine months. Is it just price a price-based shift, or is there anything more underlying uh, causing the shift? Well, um, ransomware has been something that, to be honest, my first message when I, I pushed about ransomware as a serious threat was uh, 2007. And I, I was uh, sending the message like, look, guys, this is going to be serious. Come on, this is like, we cannot really you know, ignore it now because this will be a big thing. And um, well, I think 10 years passed since uh, you know, bigger ransomware massive infections appeared, right? Uh, so maybe it was too soon to send that message, but it was the first discovery of uh, you know, uh, asymmetrical cryptography used to encrypt users' files and, and demand the ransom. Um, so uh, the ransomware evolved ever since so, uh, from just single isolated campaigns uh, driven by an individual, maybe or one group. It, it has become an industry where it, it's more like, a, you know, malware as a service enables other groups to join very quickly to deploy, you know, the infrastructure, their services and then start hitting um, the victims. And now we see completely new, new page in this story, like new trend, this ransomware 2.0, if you like, uh, which uh, doesn't only encrypt your files and demands a ransom, but but there is a thread of public disclosure there. So they're organizing these leaks 
they not only encrypt your data, not only they steal your most sensitive data and start licking this. They went even further, and I think that what they do, they, they secretly tip the journalists in the media to attract even more attention, to bring it uh, to the you know, public uh, discussion, and then create even more pressure on those companies that are hesitant to pay the ransom. Uh, the latest, like very, very latest trend is they reach out even to the clients and customers of those uh, victim companies. So they send out these emails and, say, and, and explain that, look, this company that you're using actually uh, were breached by us and your data has been stolen and, you know, they, you know, they create this reputation uh, of, of a company that is incompetent and they definitely ruin their, their image which negatively affect the whole business model. And just with one thing, to create even more pressure uh, from all sides uh, on, on these businesses. So this is how ransomware evolved. And I think that will continue evolving. Maybe even encryption will not be the, the key role here, but uh, this uh, uh, reputation risks and this pressure uh, points will be the key point. Uh, they would no longer need even to encrypt the data maybe in place that will be just something like less prioritized on their side, but they will continue these operations for sure. And uh, cryptocurrency only, you know, they, they, they allow them to do the transactions uh, like almost uh, invisibly or anonymously at least, uh, uh, hide in the crowd, uh, use mixers and launderers of uh, cryptocurrencies and, and continue running these operations. So, uh, this is not going away anytime soon, so it's rather it's better to be prepared than sorry later. So make sure you, you do have your basic uh, uh, hygiene, security hygiene. You you do uh, backups of all your critical data, and you're prepared for the day X to come when you are breached with one of these groups. Like what will be your public response? What is your you know standpoint? Are you going to to uh, give up and pay the ransom, or are you going to be strong and show this uh, strong image to your customers, to your partners, that you are not following the orders of the blackmailers, but you are fighting against them? Excellent. Anybody else have anything they want to add to that? No, I think that was pretty thorough. All right. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, how do you see the growth of copycat attacks based on solar, uh, solar flare? The idea of inserting backdoors at compile time poses a huge risk to many DevOps uh, CI implementations, many of which don't document well, or in some cases don't even put their build environments and tools under CM control. Do we, are we going to see copycat uh, similar attacks? Raise your Maybe hand. like I said, just, just <laughs> quickly, uh, it, it's, it's already happened. I mean, yeah. uh, solar winds was not the first one, right? So it's just uh, one of many. Um, and there will be more. With SolarWinds, it just was so big and it made it to the news everywhere. It's become such a serious problem that I think there will be, I would say, there will be even unnecessary attention to this threat because the attackers will see, okay, this really hurt someone. So we can do it perhaps again with another company it will hurt again. So uh, by making it such such big news uh, and and putting too much attention, it will just attract um, you know more attackers to do the same thing. So they will definitely see copycats. That's my opinion. Do you think there will be one? Yeah, I just a, a successful one as big. And you you can go ahead and take that if you want and tack it on to your your additional comments, Vandana. Oh, okay, sure. So um, I'm just saying that we've started to. Um play fast and loose with the environment. And we have far more connected systems or pieces than required. So, and uh, when we talk about these attacks, the rewards are really, really high. And so compromising one such dependency is used by hundreds of products, give you access to a lot of places where they're used. So hence, I'm sure we are going to see a lot more of what we call as supply chain attacks. Uh, I'm not sure if it's that big, maybe even more bigger or maybe a smaller. But we will see coming up of all these new attacks, uh, all these attacks for sure. Excellent. All yeah, right, we have. I, I oh, think. Go ahead, um, oh, sure. Yeah, I, I think it's it's just one of those things where, um, looking at this type of attack, I I wish I could remember where the quote is from, and I can't even remember the exact quote, but I'll paraphrase and say that it's it was a like bank robber who was saying essentially like why just go and steal one person's wallet and take their money when you can go rob the bank 
and take all of it, right? And so that's what the supply chain tax are about is it's like, okay, well, I can go hit one company or I can go hit this software vendor, you know, get get my, uh, you know, code in there at, at compile and I get 10,000 companies. So that seems like a better use of time to me. The return on investment is pretty good there. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we have about two minutes left. Um, I think we'll tie it back to the beginning and say um, the uh, the pandemic has brought a lot of focus on zero trust. Um, we have two minutes left, so if you want to take maybe thirty seconds and and um, each and say what you think um, is possible in zero trust today, like what 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 can you actually achieve um, with the tools that are available today, or or maybe what's missing. So Lydia. I think for me, um, you know, Grifter mentioned it, or for maybe uh, Vitaly mentioned it before. I think when, you know, we all got sent home and said we all need to work from home, um, at least you're, you're either going to quickly stand up massive infrastructure straight away so people can work from home or, you, or, you're, or you're going digital transformation. But I think for me, I guess one of the key things that we're still looking at is, you know, the authentication and access controls are just really, really, really important going forward. Um, especially when uh, companies are taking that cloud first approach, we've still got to make sure that, you know, companies are enforcing the MFA and, you know, at least privileges, you know, people work remotely and they, in they, and they work from home. We're implementing those stronger authentication controls. So that's my quick wrap up. Okay. Uh, 40 yep. seconds left. We'll let Grifter give up, uh, give the final thoughts on this one. Um, sure. I think, um, again, you know, zero trust, uh, we've been talking about it for years. And what it really is talking about there is doing the separation and the segmentation that we have been talking about since the, you know, at least me, since the 1990s, right? Um, we're talking about doing fundamentals here, but we're talking about doing them right. Uh, we mentioned when we we're talking about skills that maybe some of these fundamentals are really boring. But, you know, uh, give us a chance to put the fun back in fundamentals and, you know, maybe we'll get zero trust, right? I don't think we're going to end better than put the fun back in fundamentals. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'd like to about. thank the four of you for being here and uh, thank the audience for sticking in with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.